Welcome to True Fire Live. This is our very first streaming broadcast live from True Fire Studios. And you're looking at Ned Lubrecki and his banjo. Ned is in the studios to record and film two new courses. One is a bluegrass uh, banjo course for beginners. The other one is, I would say, for more intermediate players, uh, banjo, bluegrass, jamming. Uh, Ned is a quite an accomplished artist. Uh, he plays in the Becky Buller Band. He plays with Nadeski and Mojo, playing with Stephen Mogan, another True Fire artist of the Sam Bush Band. Um, he's played with everybody and his brother. He's also a phenomenal teacher as you'll witness for yourself in just a couple of minutes, and a radio personality. He's on the air, Sirius XM, Satellite Radio's Bluegrass Junction. So you can tune in Sunday afternoons from 2 to 6 Eastern Time for more Banjo Sunday. Anyway, enough talk from me. I'm going to turn this over to Ned. If I can get him to stop playing that darn bluegrass banjo, they seem to go on forever, those bluegrass jams, don't they, Ned? Pick the banjo. Pick uh, the banjo. That's what we do. You told me to come, come down here and play the banjo, so why'd you make me stop? Uh, I didn't <laughs> want to make you stop. I love listening to that. Um, let's, let's, before we dig into some of the instruction you're going to share with the folks, tell us a little bit about the uh, beginner course for bluegrass banjo. Well, the beginner course uh, is just what it sounds like. If you've never played a banjo before, if you ha have one, you ended up with one, you won the lottery and somebody dropped a banjo on your porch or something like that, and you've always wanted to know what to do with it, well, that's what it's for. So uh, I will get you started from the very basics, how to pick up the banjo, how to hold the banjo, how to wear the picks, you know, uh, what your right and left hand positioning should be. And there's a few things in there that... Uh, you know, you you might be able to, to, to find any place else. It's nice to be able to see somebody demonstrate it uh, and and be able to really get a close-up look at how your hands are supposed to be positioned. There's a few things that I know when people teach themselves, uh, there's some bad habits that I developed early on, you know, as a, as a player myself and, and had to unlearn them. And I know how hard it can be to unlearn. So I, I always try to focus, too, on the, on the technical aspect of things, like, you know, your proper hand positioning and that kind of stuff, because it's just... Uh, so much easier to learn that right, you know, in the first place. So we get you started with uh, just the real basics. Uh, the, one of the first things that you learn on the banjo are these finger picking patterns. And in the banjo uh, nomenclature, they're, they're called rolls. And I think that's something that Earl Scruggs uh, kind of started with, or at least that's the, he's the guy that kind of gave him that name. And the idea is they're just a repeating patterns that you would play uh, with your right hand, uh, usually to fit in a 2-4 or 4-4 four, four time. Uh, one of the basic ones is this alternating roll. Sounds like this. And the reason that's a good one to start with is it uses, first of all, all five strings. So you, you're getting to play one of each string. It teaches you to keep your hand steady because if your hand isn't very steady, your accuracy is going to be off. You know, if I just leave my hand up here floating, I can hit the right strings, but I'm not always guaranteed I'm in the same spot. So one of the hand position things I talk about in there is keeping your hand in a steady position like this. It teaches not only accuracy, it also teaches timing. You can feel the rhythm of that, uh, of that roll is really strong. And when you combine that particular role with changing chords, it also really helps you, first of all, it can start to sound like music right away, but also it helps you since you play every string when you do that, you can tell whether you're holding the chord down correctly. For example, if I switch to a C chord and I don't have my fingering just right, when I play that role, I might come out with... So since I'm playing every string, it gives me the opportunity to focus on making sure that each one sounds nice and clean, each note has a, has a nice, uh, nice even tone to it, and then I'm not muting any strings with my left hand. So that's one of the beginning things we'll cover. So uh, if you're not uh, tuned into the YouTube version of this yet, please do so because there's a live chat. You can ask Ned questions. 
And there's already a question from someone uh, in YouTube land <laughs> asking about the names of the courses, and he can't find you on Truefire yet. And that is because it's still the new. beginner banjo course was filmed just yesterday. <laughs> so you have to give us a little time to get that through post and packaging and branding. Um, but look for it, and I believe we're going to call that, uh, Tommy, we're, call, we're calling that uh, Bluegrass Banjo for Beginners. So you'll see that on pre-order sometime, probably within the next six to eight weeks. We're very excited to get that course out. And I will tell you this, we, <laughs> those of us in the studio that have watched Ned do his thing, we've already ordered another banjo for the studio because uh, the course really communicates very well. And um, what we heard just kind of blew our minds. So look for that in the next six to eight weeks. And the other course let's talk about, Ned, is uh, I, I don't think we've agreed on the final title, but it'll be something like Bluegrass Banjo Jamming. We're really excited about that. Is, uh, talk about jamming in general for bluegrass players. Yeah, here's the thing. When you, when you start playing the banjo, I mean, one of the cool things about playing the banjo is uh, you start right off by learning tunes. So you learn how to play a bunch of bluegrass instrumentals. You learn how to play a few standard tunes note for note. And, and a lot of people do this by learning from tablature or learning from, from courses or however it is. But, but where the fun really comes in, if anybody's been to a bluegrass festival, everybody will tell you when you go to a bluegrass festival, you go and you watch the bands on stage. But then a lot of the fun is really once you get out into the parking lot afterward and people are just jamming. And so festival jamming is really a lot of fun. A lot of uh, bluegrass associations around the country and around the world uh, promote jams where they uh, meet in a certain place like a music store or something like that. They get together on Friday nights and have a jam. And just having that interactive experience of jamming is really where it uh, gets to be a lot of fun. So what happens is if you know some tunes already by rote that you've learned from tablature, you've learned from a book, you've learned how to play it, that's one thing. And you can go into a jam and be able to play that song like you're performing it. But what happens usually in a jam is somebody will just holler out the name of a song and say, hey, let's do this one. And if, you, if you're unprepared, if you don't know that song already, you, there's a bunch of standards in bluegrass, just like there are standards in jazz and there are standards in show tunes and there are standards that, that people learn how to do. Uh, and most of them are based out of the 1-4-5 chord progression. And if you don't know what 1-4-5 means, that's one of the other things we'll cover in the course. But, but that G, C, and D, or the three chord kind of progression, and a couple other chords that go with it. So in the jamming course, what I wanted to do was give students the tools to be able to, first of all, identify the chord changes, be able to hear the chord changes in a, in a typical bluegrass chord progression, and then to be able to uh, come up with something to play over that, even if you don't know a particular solo to the song. So if you just join into a jam session and you hear the guys playing and you want to get in on it, uh, you can kind of identify where the chord changes are coming. It's usually in a pretty regular pattern, then you can grab your banjo and be ready to take a solo as soon as somebody nods toward you, you know, so you just, you, you, you give, it gives you a few, couple of the tools and the tricks of being able to just jump in and do it, even if you haven't had time to learn a proper solo to it. Ned, we have a couple of questions, good yeah. questions, um, uh, and I'll give you, I'll give them all to you right now. One is, you know, we have a lot of guitar players and yeah. a lot of guitar players that want to learn how to play banjo. As they should. Um, you know, Kathy Fink has done several courses here on Clawhammer Banjo that have done, you know, phenomenally well. So here's the questions. Number one, is there a difference in the technique you're teaching to the Clawhammer technique? Question number one. Question number two is how difficult is the transition from guitar to banjo? And question number three is, what banjo should a guitar player start off with, you know, just, just to learn how to play? Well, Answer them in any order you like. In any order I like, okay. Let's start with the difference between claw hammer and bluegrass style playing. And bluegrass style, a lot of people refer to as scrug style. Claw hammer, the style that uh, Kathy teaches, and Kathy is a great player and a great teacher too. I know Kathy uh, and, uh, and was sorry not to see her down here. I run into her at some banjo workshops all around the country. Uh, claw hammer style is sort of uh, one of the original styles that anybody played on the banjo and is played without wearing finger picks and it's down, done with a downstroke of your fingers. 
And you could hear this rhythm. There's a rhythm. They call it the bum diddy lick in uh, in Clawhammer, which goes, you know, bum diddy, bum diddy, bum diddy. And you can hear how that feels like a square dance fiddle tune. Now, claw hammer can be everywhere from a really basic stroke style that you're just playing chords to accompany yourself singing. And this is a great way to get into playing the banjo at first because it doesn't require a lot of uh, right hand of, of dexterity. It doesn't require learning a, a bunch of things. It's a real basic stroke. And then you can change chords with it. And you can see this is a really similar to strumming a guitar. So if you want to accompany yourself singing and playing, some of those styles are really good. Now it can get more complicated. You can play and play whole melodies in Clawhammer style. But in Scruggs style playing, what Earl Scruggs did is he figured out a way of using finger picks. Of course, I, I think when he first started doing it, it was even before he had finger picks. But in using finger picks, you come up with more of a pattern that sounds like this. Instead of, instead of using it as just a rhythmic accompaniment for something, Earl came up with ways of being able to play actual melodies to tunes, uh, you know, like... Now, if you're a guitar player already, or if you played any string instrument, a lot of what you know will carry over, because knowing how to fret notes, knowing how to move your left hand around a fingerboard, all that stuff is, is universal to string instruments. So you'll, you know, the, the tuning is a little bit different for the banjo. The banjo is tuned to an open chord. So learning either claw hammer style or uh, learning Scrug style, the left hand part is going to be very much the same. Now, Clawhammer uses a couple of different tunings, and Scrug Style sometimes uses a few different tunings too, but a lot of it is out of this regular G tuning. So once you learn the left hand part, then the difference between Clawhammer and, and Bluegrass Style is really just a difference in the right hand part. And was that all the questions there, what? or was there another one? <laughs> there was one more, but you did great on this. Okay, two. what was the uh, other one? What banjo should a guitar player buy to if they want to just start learning? Well, there, there are a bunch of different banjos out there. Um, one of them that I really, uh, uh, really kind of like is the Deering Good Time banjo. Uh, they're pretty affordable, and they're, they're really well made. They're made by a company that only makes banjos. So, uh, so everything from their most affordable, entry-level, good-time banjo right up to their multi-thousand-dollar professional banjos are all made with the same sort of quality control in mind. So those are good. Um, there's a difference usually that you'll see in styles of banjo. I mean, most of them are five-string banjos nowadays, and that's the other difference. There's another. There's a couple other kinds of banjos. There's a tenor banjo, which only has four strings and a shorter neck, and that's the kind that's most commonly played in like Dixieland, played with a flat pick. Uh, Irish music uses tenor banjo a lot, and that's a different instrument. It's tuned differently and it's played differently than these. But for the five-string banjo, the big difference between the two different styles is whether it has a resonator on the back. And the resonator, you know, the thing sitting there on the back. Some of them have that, some of them don't. The, the ones without it are just simply called an open back banjo. For claw hammer playing, more players prefer the open back banjo than the, than the resonator banjo. For bluegrass playing, more players prefer the resonator type banjo. For learning how to play, if it has five strings and you can play the same chords and stuff on it, it really doesn't make a difference. So if you have an open back banjo, don't worry that you can't learn how to play bluegrass on it because the notes are in the same place. You'll be fine. Great. Uh, just a quick side note for those of you that have joined us either live or uh, for the on-demand version of this. Um, we're interested in getting your feedback about what you think about these live broadcasts from the studio where we're able to better control quality. We have a lot of different angles. Um, love to get your feedback and love to know whether you'd like to see more of these from the artists that come down to, to film uh, courses with us. So, Ned, back to you. Yeah. If you've caught your breath by now. Oh, I think so. I think <laughs> Let, so. Let's go back. I know that a lot of our guitar player students are very familiar with the 145. The blues is very popular here. And, of course, the 145 is used, you know, predominantly in the blues. 
How about we do, do you have a track you might be able to play to that has a one, four, five progression and just. Yeah, us? let's do that. And I'll, I'll and do you, a you couple can of. You set it up before or after yeah. or whatever you want to do. Um, we've got a, a track. I think, uh, I think we were referring to this one as song number two. Um, and, and here's, here's a little example of what's going on in the jamming course. Uh, there's a, there are a couple of things that I go over and it, and it, it, on the banjo, one of the other things I want to set up about the banjo that's a little different from the guitar, since it is tuned to an open tuning, it's just tuned to a chord right there, the uh, the range of the banjo when you go across the fingerboard is one octave. I go from the fourth string to the first string, I have one octave. On the guitar, you can go three just just straight on across. So banjo players, the one thing about the banjo is the neck is completely uh, completely proud from the body and you use the whole thing. So banjo players tend to think up and down because we don't have that much lateral movement across the neck. So one of the really important things to learn if you're gonna learn how to jam and try to make things sound interesting is to be able to find your positions all the way up and down the neck. So that's one of the things we do, and there are a few positions, a thing that I call double stops. Double stops are simply, it's a term that's borrowed from the violin. The violin, instead of fretting a note, you stop a note. And so on violin, since there aren't frets, you, uh, you have to hold down two strings at a time, and you have to really practice these in order to make them you know, come out in tune. Well, since we're uh, more highly evolved and have frets on our banjos, we can play double stops just by using them as two different notes out of a chord. So once we learn how to play the different chord positions up the neck, we can play just partial chord positions as these double stops, and I can combine those with a different roll and play them over the different chord progressions. So for a one, four, and five, I can get my one chord here, the four chord there, and the five chord there. I can do another grouping up here from this G chord. I can get my one chord there, the four chord, and the five chord, the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. And if I put those all with a uh, chord progression, this is a pretty standard one, four, five type chord progression, you'll see how it works. Let's, let's hear the tune. One, two, three. <laughs> And then while that's still going, there's another uh, technique that I teach in the uh, jamming course. And this is something that I call an ultimate forward roll, and it's a rolling pattern that instead of changing these chords up and down, I'm doing it out of the open position. And it allows me to play something that sounds very bluegrassy while just changing some basic chord shapes. So check this one out. It sounds more like this. It'll go... We just add a couple little slides to it. And then a lick. So right there, all of that was just played over a 1-4-5 basic sort of blues chord progression. And you can see that I just, uh, in, the, in the first section of it, just let me show you a little bit about what I was doing. I was using these double stop positions of going from a, a G chord here, a G chord here, a G chord here, and a G chord there. Um, we can fade down the music here for a second. Thanks, guys. Um, the whole idea is on the banjo, there's three different ways of making a major chord. Banjo players have given them these names. There's the F chord shape. Anybody that's a banjo player will know what I'm talking about here. Um, the reason they call this one the F chord shape is the first place you can play it on the neck is as an F chord. In this position, I'm playing it as a G. There's the bar chord shape, which every guitar player is familiar with bar chords. On the banjo, bar chords are way easy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's just straight on across. So that's the bar chord shape. And then the other one people refer to as the D chord shape. And the first place you usually learn how to play it on the banjo is as a D chord. So F chord shape, bar chord shape, D chord shape. And then you can see I group them together so that I can play the one chord, 
the four chord and the five chord. So that's a G chord right there, a C chord right there, and a D chord right there. So once I learn that grouping, once I learn that I can make a G, C, and D all in one little section, the next thing I do is I take the G chord and I find the next inversion of a G chord going up the neck. So in this case, if I take the, uh, the F chord shape and I move it up four frets, one, two, three, four, and change these two fingers into the D chord shape, I'm at a G chord. So now I find the grouping up in this position where I can find my one, four, and five chords. So the G chord is right there. The closest four chord for C is just right next to it. And then back to my G. And the five chord is the bar chord right underneath of it. So there's one more section, and this is starting with the bar chord. So if I take the G chord in the D shape like that, move it up three frets, one, two, three, play the bar chord, that's my next inversion of a G chord. So if I start with that as my one chord, the four chord is right here as the D shape above it, and the D chord, the five chord, is as the F shape right below it. So the point to it is, here's one, four, and five, one, four, and five, one, four, and five. My chord shapes are all right there. Well, if I do that as just double stops, it's even easier, because watch, if I play this as my double stop for the one chord, and I need the four chord, I can get there by just moving one finger. Go back to my one chord, and if I need the five chord, I can get there just by moving one finger. You see, that is the first two strings, the double stop from that chord shape. If I go to this one, just those two strings, that's the double stop of this chord shape. And if I go with that one, that is the double stop of this shape. So G, C, D, G. Do the same thing up here. Then I move up to the bar shape. And then it continues on up. So what I did in that example was every measure, every two beats that were going by in the song, I played a different chord shape. So in the banjo, the easy way to think of it is I played that roll. I played a certain roll. And the roll is, that I played is one that I call the Foggy Mountain Breakdown Roll or the Foggy Mountain Roll. It sounds like this. The reason I call it the Foggy Mountain Roll, it's the roll that you play to play that iconic intro to Foggy Mountain Breakdown. That Everybody knows that one. So, so when you hear that sound, that roll, it's playing the first two strings, you double up on that, and then a forward roll. So every time I play through that roll, I change chord positions. So if I need four measures of G, I'll play four different G chords. One, two, three, four. Then, if I need four measures of C, I'll play four different C chords. But when I'm here, now I have to switch to wherever my closest C chord is. Well, it's right there, so I just start right here. One, two, three, four. Now, if I need four measures of D, I figure out where my closest D chord or five chord is. I could either jump up two frets and go to this one, or I could just move down one fret and grab the bar shape. So that's one of the tricks that I teach in the uh, beginning jamming course, because you can use that if you can identify what the, chord, what the chord changes to a song are, you can do that, or you can also use this if you already know how to play a bunch of other licks and say you need that technique in order to fill in a lick on a chord that you're not familiar with. So other than the one, four, and five chord shapes, you also need to know what other chords happen uh, typically in a bluegrass or folk song or something like that. So so out of, uh, out of any key, the 1, 4, and 5, we all know really well. The other chords that are really likely to come up, the 6 minor. In the key of G, you're going to play an E minor a lot. It happens quite a bit. Another, song, another chord that comes up pretty often is the F chord. That's the flat 7, if we go by the numbers. So figuring out where to find those in all the chord groupings, that also is a big help. And then you could do that same technique with those chords. So if I took a song that had, uh, that had a lot of flat sevens in it, well, as a matter of fact, do we have, uh, do we have song number four uh, available? Let's, uh, let's do that. So this one, 
This, uh, this song just has uh, a, a couple of F chords in it. So that's something that happens in bluegrass all the time, especially on those bluesy songs like Little Maggie and uh, Salt Creek. And you'll, you'll recognize the sound right away. Go ahead and roll that one. I'll show how this works. See, I just went from the one chord to another one chord, down to the flat seven, the F chord, back to the one, and then it's a five, D. G, G positions, F positions, and then straight into the five. There's another trick that you can do with all of these, and that is to add, a, uh, add another lick to it, where you can put a hammer on in there. So if I do that, So that gives you an idea of how it'll work on another one. We could fade the music down. About how it works on another chord that's, uh, that's just a little bit outside of the one, four, and five. And it'll work on other ones too. Are there any more questions coming in from the internet world? Let us check the chat. In the YouTubes. Yeah, what else is covered in the jamming course? Well, uh, part of it is also ear training. We try to, uh, we try to get you into uh, listening to a couple of chord progressions. And, and the chord progressions that I used, uh, there are actually one or two uh, progressions that I used from familiar songs. But a few of them are, are just, they're just chord progressions that we made up, really, for the, for the course. But they could be the chords to several different songs. You know, they're, they're really typical chord changes. Going from the one to the four to the five, another one that goes the one to the four, the one to the five, that kind of thing. So that in listening to those, uh, one, of the, one of the things besides playing along with the track and besides trying to play along with what's on the tablature to the track is to be able to listen to those chord changes, maybe put the tune on, get your banjo out, and just hear when it changes and try to guess or, or educated guess what the change is going to. Listen to it and, and listen whether it's going to the one chord or the five chord and how, how playing the wrong chord against it sounds. Uh, that's one of the things ear training is uh, covered in there. There's, uh, there's not only these movable chord positions, but the open rolling positions too, what I call the ultimate forward roll, and then how to dress that forward roll up with a couple of things like we did in, the, uh, in that other example where I played a slide over top of of it. And then with this C chord, I'm still playing the same roll. It didn't change the roll at all. I just did something a little different with my left hand, and it changed that from just rolling over a C chord into a C lick. And so there's a couple of examples of that, and then there are some uh, jam tracks where you'll be able to play those rolling positions along with the chord progression. Do we have the... the uh, I don't know. Let's let's try the the uh, country roads one. Is that one queued up? So here's a chord progression. These are the chords to uh, the John Denver song, "Take Me Home, Country Roads," and I'll show you a couple of uh, a couple of the things. I'll I'll do the uh, the open rolling position over some of it, and then I'll even switch into some of the movable chord shapes, and you'll hear how I can assemble pretty much a solo over the chords to that song.
So everything I did there over the chord changes to that song was stuff that we cover in the jamming course. Uh, and just to back up and show you what they all were, there was the ultimate forward roll of just playing over a G chord. And then the same thing over an E minor chord. A, a typical D chord lick that we get in toward uh, the end of the video. And then rolling over a C chord. And then for a while when I went up the neck here, I just used those chord positions over, let's say, going the one chord, G, E minor, D, C, and G. And it came out kind of sounding like banjo playing, didn't it? Well, at least I thought so. It sure did. <laughs> In the uh, beginner course, um, you talk about uh, playing melodies and uh, fill-ins. Can you talk about that just a little bit here? Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing, uh, and that's, that's a little bit the opposite of what the jamming course is, and I'll explain what I mean by that. You know, ultimately, the, the ultimate well-rounded banjo player should be able to sit down in any situation and be able to hear the melody of the song and reproduce that melody. Well, of course, when you're jamming, you don't always have time to work out the melody to a particular song. So what I try to teach you in the beginning course is not only some of the really standard stuff, that we talked about before, how to play rolls, how to do a couple of chord changes, how to play a few typical licks. But I want, to, I want you to also be able to develop the, uh, the ability to play a melody to a song the same way that you would sing it. So let's just take, for example, a tune like... Um, Let's take a tune like I'll Fly Away, you know, an old gospel song that everybody knows. And if I just played the melody to I'll Fly Away, it would come out sounding Some glad morning when this life is on, I'll fly away. So the secret to this is, number one, you've got to be able to phrase the melody the same way that you would sing it. You know, if you, if you just learned the notes, and, and this is a mistake that I've seen a lot of students make where I'll, I'll write down the tablature to a tune like this and I'll say, okay, memorize this. And they'll come back and they'll play it, and they'll play it and it'll sound like... And I look at them and tell them, you would never sing it to me that way. You, you have to make sure and keep it set to time. Once you can phrase the melody like that, and you can set it into, uh, into time the same way that you would sing it, then you can start to fill in around it. So let's say I take that same melody, and you hear there's some spaces in there. So you hear how much space there is. There's a few fill-ins that you can do. So when I play the melody note, in between each melody note, there's a thing I call it the fifth first fill-in. It sounds a little like claw hammer playing. Claw hammer playing does a really similar thing, only they go 1-5, we're going 5-1. It's just, it's really taking the same amount of space. It's just a little bit different because we're wearing picks. So listen what happens if I just put that fill-in in between the melody notes. I get this, I get a... And then when it comes to the long space, remember when we got to that note, you know, I'll, fly to down, I'll two, three, fly away, two, three, four. So there's a long space there, and you're not just going to keep going because that just gets repetitive. So instead, that's where I play a regular forward roll. So listen how that sounds. So you get the idea there of how the melody fits in and then those, uh, those fill-in notes fill in around the melody to make it sound more like banjo playing so that you're just not playing the melody all by itself out there. And we do that with a couple of tunes and then build them up uh, an arrangement right from the ground level straight on up. And it's a technique that I use a couple of examples on the video to show you how to do it. But then my hope is that what you will do is have other melodies come into your head, whether they're standard bluegrass songs or folk tunes or old gospel hymns or anything is fair game. Uh, TV show themes, think about the Brady Bunch.
okay, I might be dating myself by bringing up a song like that. And, you know, I'm not sure how to play the SpongeBob SquarePants theme on the banjo. But anything that comes into your head, even if it's a rock and roll tune or, or whatever there is, uh, I really uh, strongly feel this. Uh, sometimes if you sit around with your instrument, whether it's a banjo or a guitar or a piano or whatever it is, if you're sitting around sometimes with your instrument and you're noodling around and you're just, you're just sort of hunting around, picking out different notes, and all of a sudden you hear something that sounds familiar. It sounds like, you know, oh, that sounds like the beginning of this song I know. And you spend a little bit of time finding it, you know, searching around, playing it over and over again until you can repeat it pretty regularly. Sometimes you might feel like you're wasting time, like you're not spending the time practicing the stuff you should, like practicing your scales or your chords or whatever it is. I, I think just the opposite. I think that's the most valuable time that you can spend with your instrument. If you can, if you can hear a melody in in your head, if you can get the beginning of a tune in your head and make that come out on your instrument, you win. That's <laughs> that's the ultimate goal, I think. And so that's my idea, at least in that part of the beginning uh, banjo series. Uh, the rest of it is there's there are still other just technical things that you have to learn. You have to learn how to hold the picks, how to play the roles, how to make the right chords, and that kind of stuff. And we cover that stuff too. But I'm really strong on trying to figure out that melody part. That that's one that, that means a lot to me, and I think if you can develop that ability, man, the rest of it's just gravy. Ned, thank you for that. Yeah. Would you play one of the tunes from the beginner course, like Jesse James or good old Mountain Dew, in, you know, at the level that you teach it to show yeah. people this way, and then play a version of it kind of amped up giving us an idea of where we can take the foundation that yeah, you give right. us and build on that. Okay, let's take let's take and good feel old Mountain free to Dew. Sing too. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, I thought we wanted to get subscribers <laughs> to the YouTube thing. Um, so let's take good old Mountain Dew. That's an old tune. That's an old tune that uh, that everybody knows. Grandpa Jones used to do it Clawhammer style in the Opry. If you ever look up Grandpa Jones playing that, that's a great Clawhammer tune. So you think about the melody to good old Mountain Dew and. And the first step in this process is to be able to play the melody the same way you would sing it. So you get yourself in the key of G and you think, oh, they call it that good old Mountain Dew. So there's the melody. To me, and maybe this will make sense to you also, to me, I think about melodies as having shapes. Uh, you know, it, it, and really, if you looked at it written out in music notation, you could actually see that, where the low notes are down here and the high notes are up here. Call it that good old mountain dew. So the high note moves up high there. So let's find those notes on the banjo and go, well, they call it, call it that good old mountain dew. The other thing that I like to do is I like to round off the melody a little bit. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, if the words get a little too stumbly, if you right in there you heard where I went, call it that good old mountain dew, good old, it's just too much. So I'm going to round that off to one note. It's the same note, I'm just staggering it twice. So why not just go, well, they call it that good old mountain dew. So there's my first line. And... If, you, if you're working on it and you can't play that line exactly that smoothly, that's what you need to practice. Keep doing it over and over and over again, just that one line until it comes out as smooth as I did it. Think about if you were an actor learning parts for a play. You know, you wouldn't sit down with the entire play and try to memorize it in one night. That'd be crazy. You're gonna read. You might read the whole play in one night, but then you're gonna go back and you're gonna memorize one scene at a time. You're gonna learn your lines to one individual scene. Just make it make sense in your head. Say it a couple of times. Get your delivery and all that kind of stuff. Same thing is true of music. Why try to learn the whole song in one go? Learn it one line at a time. Get that line down to where you can play it. It makes musical sense. Then move on to the next one. So the first line. Well, they call it that good old mountain. Then think about the next line. Them that refuse it are few. And go ahead and sing along with your banjo. If you're a lousy singer like I am, don't worry. Do it when nobody else is around but you and the dog, and the dog loves you anyway. And if you have your cat, your cat is indifferent to you anyway. So just sing it out loud with your banjo. It'll be fine. So we've got the first two lines. Well, they call it that good old mountain dew. Them that refuse it are few. 
Hush up my mug if you fill up my jug with that good old mountain dew. So you see, I played the notes just the same way I would sing them, and I tried to phrase it exactly the same way. Once I have that phrasing down and I know how to play it that way, that gives me sort of an internal feel for how much space I have in between the notes. So instead of thinking about how many notes I can fit in there, I, it almost becomes sort of autopilot. So, well, I call it that good old mountain dew. So you notice, call it that, call it that good old mountain dew. There was a space there where there were three beats. There was a couple spaces where there were just one. When there's just one beat, I can put in that fifth first fill in. When there's a longer space, I'm putting in a whole forward roll. So listen to that whole line again, just playing the melody and those fill ins. So you can see, I've already played good old Mountain Dew without using any, without any tricks, any left hand techniques other than just playing the melody and just coming up with some right hand rolls that fit in around it. Now here's another interesting part of learning how to play songs by, by starting with the melody. What's one thing we haven't even talked about yet about the song good old Mountain Dew? Any question, any, anybody coming in with the, with the answer there? Well, not I'll yet, but give hopefully it to you'll you. tell us. I'll give, you, I'll give it to you. Chords. We never talked about what the chords were to good old Mountain Dew because we didn't matter. If you play the melody to a song, it's going to fit the chords. So you don't even have to know what the chords are. If you think about the way fiddle players play melodies to tunes like that, I always like to say, there ain't no chords on a fiddle. <laughs> they, they might ask you what the chords are, but they don't really care. They don't, you know, fiddle players, they're, they're really focused on playing the melody. Well, it's just like if you were singing the song. If you're singing a song and you don't have a guitar or a banjo or a piano, then what does it matter if you know the chords? If you know the melody, it will fit the chords. So I didn't play a C lick anywhere, I didn't play a D lick, and I didn't even hold down a chord whenever it happened. Now, usually whatever the melody note that I was playing was gonna be a note that's in that chord. So if I did play the proper chords while I played that song, it might come out sounding a little bit better. But as long as I can play the melody, I don't really have to know the, the chords. So let's go back over that, uh, over that song again. By holding a C chord over one part, I was able to make it sound a little bit more like I changed chords, but it still played the melody pretty well. And that gives you a good idea of how to, uh, how to build a song up from the ground uh, using, using just the melody. The other part of the, of the beginning banjo chorus goes into playing uh, a few more standards because later the other thing that you're going to have to do is start to use some of these standard licks to assemble your solos that way. And that's what we did in the jamming course where we talked about playing the ultimate forward roll and adding a slide or adding a hammer on or adding some of those things. So as a beginner, if you don't have any of those tools yet, the first thing to be able to do is to play the melody to the song and be able to keep that pretty strong. But then where do you get those other tools? The way that I usually teach and, and the way that I feel like is the best source of those is by learning a few of the other standards that, uh, that, that are really what bluegrass banjo is made of. One of the tunes that I teach is Cripple Creek. It's one that, uh, that everybody knows in jam sessions. It happens all the time. And it uses all the different left-hand techniques. So uh, other than playing a chord or holding down a particular note, the three things that your left hand needs to know how to do are play a slide. Slides are simply when you play a note and slide to another note. Slides are almost always in an upward direction from a lower fret to a higher fret. Every once in a while you might slide backward, but hardly ever. And you can slide just one fret, or you can slide three or four frets. There's the pull-off, where you play a note fretted and pull back off. Uh, you can either pull off to an open string or pull off from a fretted note to another fretted note. And then there's the hammer-on where you play an open note 
and hammer your finger down or from a fretted note to another fretted note. The tune Cripple Creek uses all of those, and that's the example that I use. So if we take the slide, two to three on the third string, and then play that and in, incorporate it into an alternating roll, that's most of the tune Cripple Creek right there. So once you learn how to do that, pull off, hammer on, three. Then later you can use those same techniques that you've learned in some standard bluegrass tunes like Cripple Creek and Cumberland Gap and those kinds of things and apply those. And if I apply a couple of those ideas to good old Mountain Dew, So you can see I used the licks that I learned in Cripple Creek and just incorporated those into the melody of good old Mountain Dew. And instead of just uh, playing over the chord progression, I was actually playing the melody to the tune and using, uh, using some bluegrass banjo licks for good instead of for evil. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we a little side note comment from one of our students in Italy says, you move your hands like an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my last name is Luberetsky, and that, uh, there you go. but I'm afraid it's, it's a little north of Italy. So um, <laughs> we're running out of time here. There's two things I'd love to ask you to do. Yeah. Um, but I won't give you both at the same time. <laughs> okay. Pick any song, any song that you might play on your own, with or without a track, and play it the, how you might play it at a jam or on the stage. All right, let's take a good old tune. Let's take a tune like uh, the old Lonesome Road Blues. This is a really standard chord progression, and, uh, and I'll play it how I would play it. And if you, even if I play it, try to use the melody and play exactly how I would play it, take a look at how many of those jam session techniques that I put into this tune. There'll be a few. So... That ending, I'm not going to teach you. I'll figure that out on your own. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks, man. Uh, we have a question about while you're looking for a banjo, are there any exercises that you can practice on the guitar while you're waiting for your banjo to arrive? Well, let's see. The One of the things when it comes to practicing the right-hand part of the banjo, one of the things that really... Uh, and I know for guitar players, when they move over to the banjo, the fifth string becomes really confusing because you always think when you're hearing that higher note, you always want to move down on the neck, you know, toward the higher strings that go higher in pitch. And it's a little weird getting used to this. So playing the five string banjo and learning the right hand finger picking patterns without a banjo, that one's going to be a little bit, a little bit strange. But one thing you can do on the guitar uh, to get used to sort of banjo-ness is if you tune your first string from an E down to a D. Uh, these three strings, D, G, and B, are the same on your guitar or your banjo. So if you know how to make an F chord on the guitar, 
Well, it's the same F chord here on the banjo. You would just use your little finger out here on the first string. So one thing you can do if you really want to get used to sort of banjo tuning and how you make the chords and where you'd find the notes is you can just tune your first string down a whole step to a D instead of an E, and that will, uh, that will give you banjo tuning, and you can start working out these chord positions. You can start doing that right now. That's really interesting. That's like, is that like a double drop D, but the higher half of the... Yeah, kind of. And it's, it would be as a, and, and also, it's the same tuning first through fourth as you would use for a dobro. The dobro then just has two lower strings with a B and a G on the bottom. Um, but if you've ever been in like open G tuning like a dobro uses, that's the same as the banjo. You just have this extra one up here. Another question. Um, what do you do jamming in keys other than G? Capo or? Yeah, so for this course, we we wanted to uh, stick to pretty much what you would do in jamming in the uh, in the key of G because a lot of times what often happens on the banjo is since the banjo is tuned to an open G chord, if we were going to say play some standard bluegrass songs in the key of B flat, um, instead of playing them in B flat, and a lot of times you can do it. You know, B flat's not such an unusual key to try to play in, but here's what happens: if I took a song like uh, Blue Ridge cabin home that everybody does in bluegrass if i play it in g there's a well-beaten path on this old mountainside where i wonder when i was a lad you get that sound now if i played it in b flat you can hear it's missing that open string sound that everybody associates with the banjo. So for a lot of keys, you would mostly, if I were going to play Blue Ridge Cabin Home in B-flat, I would capo up three frets and play it that way. With a capo in the open G tuning, this gives you A, B-flat, B, C, and you can capo as high as D if you need to. For other keys, it is worth learning how to play uh, melodies to bluegrass songs out of the other keys that are relative to the key of G. So I would also spend a little time learning how to play in the key of C and also in the the key of D, uh, learn the one, four, and five chords out of those keys, and we didn't have time to get into all that, but that might be another future addition is uh, how to play out of other keys in open tuning, but once you can do, once you can play comfortably in the key of G and join into a jam along with anything, which is going to be 80% of what you do out there. Uh, then learn how to play stuff out of the key of C, then the capo gives you D, F, and even E, and then if you learn how to play in D, you've got D, E, F, and right back around the circle all the way back to G. So really, if you can learn how to play in three different keys on the banjo, you got it covered. Awesome. Thanks, man. And uh, you definitely will be coming back based on the great stuff we collaborated on this trip. Hey, there's a I demand mean, there's so for Somebody's more, already right? looking for me on there. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's wrap up with uh, another question. What do you do when someone asks you to shred on the banjo like? like an Eddie Van Halen or something. Oh, well, simple. I do this. Well, they mentioned Van Halen. How could I not? <laughs> Ned, thank you so much, man. We're thrilled to welcome you to the family. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this too far live thing in the middle of everything else we got going on down here. And uh, based on the response we're already getting, I think uh, you're going to find a lot of people are just as happy as we to ha have you here, and we're looking forward to having you back as well. Well, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, it was it was such a lot of fun going through the shoot. Uh, the team here has been great to work with. Uh, they've been really helpful in keeping me on track and making sure that everything uh, everything made good uh, good chronological and pedagogical sense. And and just looking at the way. Uh, the system works here for True Fire. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of it. It's really cool. Thanks, guys. Awesome, man. Why don't you play us out, and we'll fade out of the limelight. Ciao, everybody. And Italy, too. <laughs>